Proverbs 24. I'm going to read two verses this morning. Verse number 17. The Bible says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now, first things first, we've got to address what the word enemy means. Okay, now enemy means to be the adversary of, to seek the destruction of another, right? That you have arrayed yourself against another person with the sole intent of making sure that the other person doesn't accomplish anything that they want to accomplish. All right, an enemy seeks the destruction of another. Okay, whether that's financially, whether it's morally, whether it's socially, whatever capacity you want to consider it an enemy is somebody that wants your destruction now an enemy doesn't always necessarily want to be the one that destroys you okay for instance you know we can look at all the mess that's going on in the world today right there hadn't been a true war right as far as America's been concerned where there's a clear designated enemy and then our troops are lined up against their troops, right? There hasn't been that since arguably Vietnam. Okay, well, who are terrorists, right? That's not a nation. That's not a group of individuals that you can point and say, yep, that's them right there. Right? Sometimes the enemy isn't the one doing the actual fighting against you. Okay, a lot of times they stir up others to act against you. Well, how do you say that now? They, all these goofy cyber attacks. Right? You, you know what the point of all that is, right? It's to cause big companies to go, you know, under to where they can't operate anymore, and then that'll crash the stock market or that'll crash a certain part of an economy, and then that country goes under, not because of bullets and grenades, but because somebody in a different country was paid off to try and make this server go down in the U.S. Right? They've tried to... Yeah, all around the world they've done cyber attacks to take down power grids and water infrastructure and hydroelectric dams and all those kind of things why to cripple or destroy another country right? well that's an enemy but who's the enemy of a Christian right? what the New Testament tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood right? we wrestle against principalities spiritual darkness you know, wickedness in high places, right? Our enemies, our warfare is a spiritual warfare, right? But this isn't talking about the devil and his angels. This isn't talking about the Antichrist and the prophet over in the book of Revelation. It's not talking about, you know, spiritual matters. This is talking about flesh and blood. Who is the enemy of a Christian? Well, depends on. Took, Brother Tommy's got many enemies. There's a lot of people who don't like Brother Tommy. I'm kidding. But an enemy for a Christian is somebody that makes themselves an enemy of a Christian. Christians don't make enemies. But other people can make themselves your enemy. Now let's break it down for a second. Were we not commended by Christ to take the gospel to the whole world? Were we not supposed to preach the gospel to every living creature? Were we not to love sinners but hate sin? Were we not to pray that the Father's will be done? But what's the Father's will? That none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How can you pray that God saves sinners when you've made sinners your enemy? A Christian does not make enemies of other people. You do not choose that you are going to be the enemy to somebody else. Look at Christ. How many times do you find that God winking at their ignorance, that God in the flesh, knowing that they were asking Him questions so that they might have cause against Him to have Him executed, to have Him crucified, He would stand... A, right in front of those that made themselves his enemy 
but he would tell them the truth of God. They hated him because he was the friend of publicans and sinners. But nobody that came to Jesus and asked a question ever left without an answer. Am I saying that we're supposed to open arms, hug everybody that comes our direction? No, we're supposed to look for wolves in sheep's clothing. But we're not to make that wolf our enemy. We're supposed to, by the grace of God, do our best to shine a light to where they're no longer a wolf, but they're sheep. Your mission as a Christian is to convert those that are the enemy of God because they're sinners and be an instrument so that the Holy Ghost can work on that person's heart and conviction and they come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And I wish that I could stand up here today and say that the only enemies a Christian will face are lost people. That's not true. Are people that know nothing about God? That's not true. But a true Christian makes no one their enemy. Okay, let's just get that straight. So who makes themselves, who decides to be an enemy of a Christian? Well, that we can flip a coin, we can you know, write a whole bunch of things down in a hat. It could be anything on any day. Right, we throw off on other people, well, they're doing that with no reason. How often do we do things without a reason? Right, how fickle can our flesh be right how weak can we be on certain days right you ever just had a bad day and for about a week you're just angry at the world right somebody can walk up and offer you ice cream and you're still angry at them right well thankfully right I've got a holy ghost inside of me that starts working on me usually about two seconds after I'm angry at the world trying to get me to realize that hey God's grace is sufficient for you it is a bad day right but it didn't destroy you so let's just keep going there's no reason to turn it into a bad week or a bad month and to be angry at everything and everybody right instead right could be, and could be somebody in this room right we don't know what the day brings forth I don't know what I'm capable of don't even know the thoughts of my own heart but God does right but somebody that makes themselves an enemy of a Christian is somebody that decides that they don't like them and they want to see them destroyed now do they want them to be killed most of the time not they want to ruin your reputation they want to ruin your testimony they're looking for cause to talk bad about you to other people Maybe somebody on the job that wants to discredit you because they think that you don't deserve what God's blessed you with. Maybe somebody that in your own family wants to find cause to not have to listen to every time that you bring up the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody that's just looking for an excuse to where they can say what that person has isn't real. But for whatever reason, they want to destroy something about you. And whatever it is that they want to destroy, really what they're saying is they're attacking your joy. They're attacking your peace. They're trying to find the end to your long suffering. They're trying to rile you up to where you blow that meekness and you say something crass or you say something out of hand meant to hurt somebody. They're trying to get you to be the exact opposite of what you desire to be. They're poking and prodding at you. Why? To destroy you, whether it's social, right? There's a bunch of jokers out there that'll tell you if you give me all your money, I'll invest it in this, and then you'll never see them again, and they're on a yacht down in the Caribbean avoiding charges. Right? There's a whole lot of people out there that want to be your enemy, but the key is that I don't decide who my enemies are. I'm supposed to be a light to all. I'm supposed to be salt so that hopefully the Lord through His grace and His mercy doesn't send Christ back to get the church and they've got enough time to hear the gospel and enough time to sit with the gospel and let it impact them to where they can get saved. How's that going to happen if I decide they're my enemy and I want to destroy them? 
truly I wish we could all stand up here and say we have no enemies right the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God but you know what can prevail enemies can prevail over Christians the church is on its way up the devil can't do anything touch the church so what's the devil try to do he tries to take people to destroy other people and in these two verses and in other passages that we're going to get to we find how to deal with enemies now I wish we could say that none of us have enemies but truly what our desire should be is, is that I make no enemies we're all going to have enemies but so long as we don't make those enemies we can stand before God and say Lord I did my best to live and shine and show the love of God to other people and I never decided that that person deserves destruction because do you realize even when you were the enemy of God conceived in sin, born into sin sinner by trade, by practice by will you were the enemy of God because you were a sinner but yet, he did not make you his enemy and send his son so that he could show you grace and mercy and long-suffering and forgiveness so that you'd no longer be an enemy, but you'd become a member of the family of God. There's a difference between having enemies and making enemies. Right, so, let's get back down to verse number 17. It says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Now keep in mind, we're not making enemies. These are people that have decided that they are our enemy. So first, he says, rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. Now by context, in the Bible when it says that a man falls, it means that he's come to some kind of ruin. Right? We can look at the story of the Good Samaritan. Right? That Jewish man that fell in the ditch that day, he had fallen. Right? He had been left for dead. He had no possessions any longer. Right? He was unable to help himself. He was unable to get up out of the ditch. And he was unable to get to where he needed to be in order to get some help. That's what fallen means. Right? You can be saved and you can fall. Right? Let a man that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Right? You can think you've got everything in your life figured out only to learn that you fell. Right? Falling means that they're at a point where they're destitute. They can do nothing for themselves and unless somebody else does something, they're going to die. Well, if somebody's your enemy, right? They've made themselves your enemy. It says rejoice not when that person falls. Why? Because when they fall, they're closer than ever for eternal damnation. Even if they're saved, they're closer than ever than having to stand before God and give an account for the deeds that they've done in their body. And I can promise you this, that judgment seat's not going to be a merciful judgment seat. We shall reap what we've sowed. It's in God's mercy that He gives us time down here to make it right, but that doesn't mean that what I've done isn't going to have to be answered for. Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Because if that person is my enemy, they've made themselves my enemy, I should desire that they're no longer an enemy, but that they're a friend. Because let's be honest, you're not going to have enemies if you're not living for the Lord. You know when you have enemies? When somebody's trying to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. You want an easy life? Throw Jesus out the window and live however you want to in the world. Devil's not going to bother you. World's not going to bother you. Those that have enemies are those that are advancing the cause of Christ. Why do you think that 11 of the 12 apostles died a martyr's death? And not just them. Stephen and 
So many others. Why do you think that was? Because they didn't make enemies. But other people wanted them destroyed because of what they stood for. In order to have enemies, that means you've got to be living for the Lord. And in order to live for the Lord, you've got to have a heart that you want everybody to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord and everybody to be in the right spirituality with the Lord so that they're living for the same goal. Now we know. I mean, we're all members of one church. Collectively, the church has things that the church is doing. But individually, God may be using you to do something that He's not using me to do. Doesn't mean that we've got to be linked up arm in arm and every day we walk out together two by two. But what it does mean is that as a whole, we understand as a church, God wants us to do more than just one thing. Or else He'd have us here seven days a week doing one thing. Right? Where to go out to the world and then come back together to worship. You each have your own individual mission for God. Right? And certainly husbands and wives, they're probably going to share a few of their missions. Right? Because in God's eyes, they're one flesh. Right? God's not going to cause disharmony in the home by having two different, you know, two people that have testified before others. We love each other and believe that this is the will of God for us to get married. God's not going to split them two apart by giving them two different missions. Don't know where that came from, but you're welcome. Nowhere in the notes. But what do we say? We all may have different missions when we leave, but when we come back together, we're one body. Why do we go out and do different things? So that Christ can be more magnified and more glorified. Because we understand that God uses people, and me as a person can reach people that you as a person can't, and vice versa. But when we go out there, that, what's our goal? That all those out there get in. Doesn't matter to me which Bible believing church they become a member of. All that matters is that they get saved. Right? How many people do you think the Apostle Paul preached to that started a church or attended a different church after he had left? Right? Where do you think that Philip in the Ethiopian? Where do you think the Ethiopian went to church at? I don't know, but it was somewhere in Ethiopia. It wasn't back with Philip. Right? What did Philip do after he got saved? God told him to go back. And where did the Ethiopian go? He went back to Ethiopia. What's the point? Doesn't matter what God chooses to do with our efforts. All that matters is we want enemies to not be enemies anymore. We want them to be friends. So why would I rejoice when somebody that truly, in my heart, I desired that they get right with God, why would I rejoice when they fall? Them falling means that they're closer than ever than entering into eternity. Them falling means that hardships come to them. Anybody ever experienced hardship? Anybody ever heard the phrase, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy? Well, do you mean it? There's some things I've been through I wouldn't wish on anybody. Why? Because they were hard. That's why it's called hardship. Right? But just because somebody says that they're my enemy doesn't mean that I want them to be destroyed. A true Christian sees someone in need and wants to help them. Doesn't matter that they've done wicked or evil to me before. All that matters is that they need help. Then it says, not only rejoice not, it says, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Rejoicing is an outward thing. Rejoicing is letting it be known that I'm happy that somebody else has been destroyed. It's just not just saying, don't go around talking about how happy you are that your enemies come to naught. He's saying also, let not thine heart be glad. He's talking external and internal. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Back in the day when I played football, when I was on the debate team, I did not like it when the other guy won. But for that little bit of time, that guy was not my friend. Okay, who was he? He's somebody that needed to be wiped the floor with so that I got the trophy. 
Right? Or that was somebody that I was going to hit as hard as I could and didn't care what happened to them because we wanted to win. After the game, that's a different story. But during the game, mm -mm, you are not on my good list. That doesn't matter how much I like you. If we got put in the same debate room, you're not my friend no more. Right? Well, just as much as I didn't like not winning, that, we're talking about more than that. Here, these are greater stakes. It says, let not your heart be glad when he stumbleth. Okay, now, does stumbling mean that they fell? No, it means that they got caught up for a second. They may have tripped, but they got back up. But we're all human here. Anybody ever have somebody? Let's just be. Y'all, everybody got one. That one person at work that for whatever reason just gets on your nerves. Maybe because objectively they're the most annoying person that has ever walked the earth. Right, I seem to work with those. But anybody ever had that person make a mistake and it gets blown up and it gets made a big deal about it in the office? Right, and you're like, ha, got what was coming to you. The Bible says you shouldn't do that. First off, there's the question of, did you make that person your enemy or did they make themselves your enemy? But then second, even if they are your enemy, I know how much it hurts to stumble I know how much it hurts to have your pride knocked down a notch I know how much it hurts that even though you got back up and kept walking those scars and those cuts and those bruises I know how. let's be honest yesterday trying to clear the stupid snow and the ice off right walk back into the garage garage is that smooth concrete right the shiny kind of concrete guess what happened Jordan hit the smooth concrete and went skating and then fell right on his back. I'm hurting today. I stumbled. Right? I was even wearing my good ice boots. Didn't help. Right? What are you saying? It's hurt. I got a bruise on my shin. Don't know where it came from. But guess what? It hurts. But somebody that stumbles, right? By definition. We go to the New Testament. Every time that you see that somebody stumbles, right, it's a hindrance to them. Right? Every time that somebody stumbles, there's an opportunity for them to learn or there's an opportunity for them to stay down. When somebody stumbles, they either get angry that they stumbled and double down on what caused them to stumble or they take heed and listen and say, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong. If I'm glad that somebody who says they're my enemy stumbles, I'm not going to be there to say, hey, it's all what happened. Been there, done that. You want to know what helped me out of it? Then take them to the Word. You know what's not going to happen? If in my heart I'm glad that they've stumbled, I'm going to want them to stay there and be miserable. I'm going to be the last person to go and offer a helping hand. But yet again, story of the Good Samaritan. Doesn't matter what that person would do for me in that situation. The Samaritan knew that the Jewish man wouldn't even have looked in his general direction because he was the off-scour of the world. He's a half-breed. The Jewish man would have done nothing for him. But the Samaritan said, doesn't matter who he thinks he is to me. I see somebody in need. And I'm going to help them. You know how you get there? you got to deny self and embrace Christ. It's easy in the flesh to take joy or to take happiness, maybe even to rejoice in the failings of those that seek your destruction. But it takes a supernatural and holy desire to go to the person that once you destroyed and to go and help them when they need help the most. You know what the opposite of rejoicing is? Mourning. You know what the opposite of having a glad heart? It's to be broken hearted. When was the last time that you got broken hearted or you mourned when something terrible happened to somebody that hates you? 
Christ was broken hearted for those that hated him hanging on the cross he says father forgive them for they know not what to do the ones that plucked the beard from his face that beat him that scourged him that cried crucify him crucify him yet with eyes of love he looked on him and said father don't lay this to their charge they don't understand what they're doing. What's the truth of those that are our enemies? Most of the time they don't realize what they're doing. They don't understand why they have the desires that they do. They don't understand why they may hate us. They just know that there's something about us that doesn't agree with what's in them. And you know what the carnal man's natural instinct is for things that are different? To want it to be destroyed. Go and look at all of history. The minority is always oppressed. Why? Because they're different. Those with fringe ideas are scoffed and mocked at. Why? Because they're different. But we're the remnant of the cause of Christ. He promised there'd always be a remnant. Ever since the beginning, there was always a few that were sent to the rest of the world. There may be more of us now than ever, but I guarantee you this, we're still the minority. We're different. This world is not our home. We're just strangers and pilgrims passing through. Right? We're aboard a ship called the old ship of Zion, and we're sailing past a world that sees us and that we're on our way to something better. They don't understand it, and they hate it because it's different. They're just doing what comes natural to them. Now, that doesn't make it any easier when they hate you. Doesn't make it any easier when they try to destroy you. But how many examples can we take from the Word of God that unless it's God's will, it doesn't matter what it is, it can't touch me. I may go through it, but the ship's going to keep on sailing. Well, let's look at verse number 18. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turned away his wrath from him. Now let's stop and take a second here. Why did that person stumble? Because of the wrath of God. Who is God's wrath turned on? Those that don't live according to what thus saith the Lord. Again, we're not just talking about lost folk. If you're a child of God and you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. God's wrath can even be turned out on His own children. Why? For their betterment. Go and look. Study your Bible. And see, find me one instance where God's wrath came and it wasn't meant to teach a lesson. God doesn't just pour out His wrath to pour out His wrath. Before Nineveh was destroyed, did not he send Jonah? The whole city, it says, from the king on down to the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor, got right with God. But you know what Jonah was sent to teach? Get right or God's judgment's coming. Those that know better Let's look at Israel. How many times did Israel, God have to raise up a man to go back and tell them, hey, y'all know better than to do this, but you're doing it anyway. Make straight the way of the Lord. Get back to the old paths. Right? Go back to what God said y'all to do, not to whatever nonsense is going on here. Right After wrath came, what was it meant to do? To prove that the ways of the world will not succeed. So if somebody stumbles or if somebody has fallen because of the wrath of God, God didn't send it to destroy... Notice, it didn't say when the enemy dies. It said fell and stumbled. What's that mean? It's not over yet. Now thankfully God sends correction and He doesn't pour out the full wrath of God on us. But someone will reap what they sow. And a lot of times they reap a stumbling block or they reap a ditch that they fall into 
because of what they've already done before. But you know what the point of that wrath was? To correct, to teach, to prove to them that their way isn't the right way. But anybody ever been, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know the answer to this. Anybody ever been corrected by God? Right? Not an enjoyable experience, but why is it unenjoyable to prove to us, to convince us that what we thought was right is not right? And most of the time we knew it was wrong in the first place, but we did it anyway, and we still had to be corrected by God in order to admit that we were wrong. Right? Well, why when somebody has just been corrected? I know that they're mentally probably emotionally sometimes maybe even physically at their weakest why would I want to take pride in that knowing that I've been where they're at except I've been where they're at with the hope that God wanted to make me into something better they have no hope they don't know God they're miserable and they've got nothing to look forward to Right? they've had everything taken away from them and they don't know which way's up anymore. Thankfully, I always know which way's up. It's towards Him. I know where the Father's house is at. They don't know anything. All they know is, is that they need help. Wrath, judgment, is always meant to correct. Does not the Bible say, How shall they hear without a preacher? You say, well, Brother Jordan, I'm not called to preach. God may not have asked you to preach. Because guess what? The Holy Ghost, best preacher ever been. All He asked you to do was be obedient. To take the seed so that the Holy Ghost can do some preaching to them. But what do they need in order to have preach it? They've got to have the Word. That's why it said, you know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word. And then it says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? All you've got to do is take the word to them. God will do the preaching. I promise you. But when they're at their lowest, the last person that they expect to show up is going to be you. Because they've tried to destroy you. But when you show them, I don't care what you think about me. I wish you wouldn't think that, but it doesn't bother me. You know what I'm concerned with? That you need help. I mean, we can go one chapter forward. We can read the verses where we're supposed to give drink to our thirsty enemies. If our enemy is hungry, we're supposed to feed him. And we're supposed to let God do the rest. Just because they want my destruction doesn't mean I want theirs. But then talking about enemies the key thing in verse number 18 is not that wrath's been poured out on our enemy the key thing is how we react when God deals with our enemy keep in mind he's just said rejoice not let not your heart be glad he says lest or in other words if we do take joy if we rejoice in it if our heart is glad in it God's going to do something different God's already promised that man shall reap what he sows nothing we can do to change that nothing we can do to avoid that ever since God said let there be light you know what he's saying he created light and light shone you know what that is reaping and sowing he made light so that there was no more darkness it's been that way since the beginning right? it'll be that way through all of eternity right? because of that is just it is righteous it's the way things ought to be not according to brother Jordan but according to God right? well he's saying even though they deserve it if we take the wrong position if instead of having compassion on them well brother Jordan they don't deserve it we didn't deserve compassion either that's what compassion means 
instead of showing them help, instead of being the tool of God, after God has broken someone, what does He always do? He tries to offer to put them back together. Now don't be misled. Not everything bad that happens in the world is God's wrath. Sometimes bad things happen because people are reaping what they're sowing. But here it's saying God's trying to get this person to a point where they're willing to receive what it is that we have to tell. And he says, if you take joy in it, if your heart's glad inwardly because the person that says they're your enemy has suffered ill, he says, lest, but the Lord see it. And it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. God said, if you're happy seeing those that hate you destroyed, one, it'll displease him. But two, he'll turn away his wrath, and you'll have to face the enemy for longer. God says you can either help them, or God will use them to be a hindrance to you. You say, that won't happen. Look at how many times God did that for Israel. I mean, we're talking about Solomon here. Wrote the book of Proverbs. Do you realize that when Solomon was king, Israel had peace the entire time? You know what Solomon was known for? Taking those that wanted to be his enemy and making them his friends. Nobody fought against Israel because they saw how great Israel was. I mean, we can go back and look at the example where the queen of Ethiopia comes up. Or no, Queen Sheba comes up. She's trying to figure out the secret on how Israel's so great. Guess what conclusion she came to? Israel's great because of Israel's God. They all thought if they could find the secret, they too could be great. But when they realized it wasn't Solomon, it wasn't the Israelites, it wasn't all the princes, it wasn't all the mighty men that they had in their kingdom, but that it was that they were faithful to God, they knew there was no way that they could stand against Israel. So they became the friend of Israel. And he did it all without raising a sword once. They had peace through Solomon's time. But what happened afterwards? Israel started getting a little rejoiceful, or started rejoicing, got a little glad when their enemies suffered ill. And instead of going out and saying, hey, yo, I know that you don't like us, but we want to help you. And while we're here, we want to tell you, you don't hate us because there's something. He said, we're pretty, pretty similar here. It's not that you don't like me, it's that you don't like our God. But there's a cure for that. It can be your God. Instead of doing that, they took joy in it. What happened? God would turn back His wrath, His judgment. And as a result, Israel had to face that enemy for years to come. What are you saying? I wonder how many things we have to keep facing in our life because instead of humbling ourselves and in a meek and loving and compassionate way we go to those that we know hate us and offer them help instead of doing that we've got to still contend with it every day in the flesh because God's turned back his judgment on somebody else just to prove a lesson to us if you don't think that God can use anything in the world to get a lesson across to us I will remind you that he caused a donkey to preach to Balaam I'll remind you that he used bitter rivers and tree branches to get a point across to Israel. I'll remind you that Jesus pulled a fish out of the water one day that had the money to pay taxes in it. God can use whatever he wants in order to get a lesson across. He's God. He's only in control of everything. But you're saying, you say, well, Brother Jordan, God wouldn't use somebody to be an enemy against his people to get a point across really Saul made himself the enemy of David 
But you want to know the reason that I believe David found God's grace and mercy throughout all of it? Because David still loved Saul. That was God's anointing. He said, Lord, you put him there. You're going to have to take him off of the throne. I'm not going to kill him. That was his father-in-law. He married Saul's daughter. But yet three times he had the opportunity to kill Saul, and David said, I won't do it. One, that's God's anointed man, and I won't touch him. That's God's business. That's not my business. And two, I believe he had compassion on him. He's saying, Saul used to be great. Saul can get back to great. All he's got to do is get back to the Lord. What are you saying? All those times that David was in caves? What he found? He found refuge on the run in the middle of the Philistines. Philistines hated David. You know how many great champions of you know, the Philistines he had killed? No telling. We know that he killed Goliath, but you know how many times Israel fought the Philistines? All right, let's reverse that. The Philistines fought the Israels? Israelites? Do you know who was their commander every time that happened? David. Where was David? I mean, David's always on the front lines. That's just the way that he was. If there's fighting to do, he's going to be out front. What are you saying? But God can use anybody to do anything. You're telling me that God's above taking somebody that you delight in seeing destroyed, him staving off his judgment and wrath, just so that that person could be the thorn in your side to get you right with God? Yeah, God could do that. Why? Right, because he's God. But truly what we're saying, when we take joy in those that hate us being destroyed they may be cast down into a ditch they may have just stumbled and skinned their knee but inwardly we're glad because the person that wants us to do harm is hurting you know what we're doing we're tempting God that person is not our enemy hopefully get back to the beginning they're not our enemy because I chose that they were my enemy they're my enemy because they don't know different and they hate that I'm different than they are they hate me because I have something that this world can't comprehend. The light shined in darkness and darkness knew it not. You don't understand the things of God until you become a member of the family of God. But when I delight in their destruction, you know what lesson God wants to prove to me? That even though I was His enemy, even though I hated everything to do with God, He didn't destroy me. In fact, it was long. That means to suffer long. He suffered the pain, suffered the indignity that my life was to Him. You realize before you got saved, your very breath was a testament of the fact that God let sin continue so that those that were sinners could be saved you know what that did for a long time things existed that weren't holy and it tempted God to destroy it because he was holy but yet he suffered that temptation for what you to be saved so that you could become like him you know when we take joy in the destruction of our enemies when we're happy when those that hate us suffer illness God's just liable to teach you how much it hurts to see somebody that hates you but yet have a burden for them. God's willing to teach you that lesson for a long time. How long? Until you get it. But you're tempting God by saying, Lord, I know that you cared for me when you shouldn't have, but I'm not going to care for that person when I should well, according to verse number 18, it displeases God when we do it. You know what that means? You should have compassion on that person. We can justify to ourselves, well, if they don't like me, then I don't have to like them. Wrong. According to God, you're supposed to not take joy when your enemy stumbles. You should be concerned. 
you should be compassionate. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water. And not dirty gutter water, give him the good stuff. Comes out of the Brita or whatever you have at your house. Right? The clean stuff. Not the stuff that came out of the faucet that's got rust on it and everything else. No, the good water. Don't give him moldy bread. Give him the choice meat. Why? Because when somebody knows that we have no reason to interact with them, but yet we still choose to have compassion on them, that's when rubber meets the road. That's when they realize, well, maybe because they're different, there's something good about that different. Why would somebody that I hate be compassionate to me? Well, I'm glad you asked. His name's Jesus. But on the other side, you know what the world enjoys? The destruction of those that they call their enemy. Except the world makes enemies. Again, if there's somebody that you look at them and you call them your enemy, I'd get in the altar and ask God to change your heart. Because Christ made no enemies. He had enemies, but He didn't make them. They chose to be His enemy. Christians today should make no enemies. In fact, when we see people that hate us, you know what I see? A prime candidate for God to do something in that person's life. Because obviously they care a lot. It takes a lot of effort to hate. It takes a lot of effort to go try and destroy somebody. Well, if they care that much, when they find out that all their care and all their effort came to nothing, usually that person, when they're down to nothing, God's up to something, as Brother Greg would say. When they've run out of reasons and options on how to destroy you, you get an opportunity to tell them, when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. Right through my weakness, God's grace can be made perfect. His strength made perfect in my weakness. It's not about me, it's about in whom I have believed. But you know how we get to that point? It doesn't matter how angry they are, how much they hate us, it doesn't matter how ugly they might be in their actions towards us. When we can look past what they do and see what they need, that's when we truly become Christ-like. He had no respect of persons. It was His will that whosoever may come. You know what that means? He had to look past all the things that they did to make themselves his enemy. And he had to look past it to see that he still needed to be their friend. And after they got saved, guess what? He's the friend that's sticking closer than a brother. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.